welcome to this special bonus episode of our podcast. This is bonus episode 8, Daniel Craig. In this episode, we're going to take a deeper dive into the career of Daniel Craig. So for any long-time listeners, or if you're just discovering our podcast, hopefully you'll find something valuable in this episode. So Jay, why don't you give us a little bit of information about our subject matter. So I'm going to kick us off and do a little bit of the bio. So name at birth was Daniel Walton Craig. Daniel Craig is an English actor born on March 2nd, 1968 in Chester, England. He's probably best known for his role as James Bond in the popular 007 franchise. You mentioned his birthday, so that makes him a Pisces. He's got two children and one sibling. Uh, He's been married twice. So his first marriage was to Scottish actress Fiona Loudon. The couple had a daughter named Ella together. But however, they divorced in 1994. Craig's second marriage was to actress Rachel Weiss, whom he married in 2011. Now, Andy, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you know what film she's been in? I've seen her in stuff. <laughs> and for the life of me, I can't think. I need, I need time to research these things. Sorry, Andy. I, I did put you on the spot there. It's just when I think of her, I just think of the one film. I'm I sure she's done other films, but I just think she's in The Mummy. That is the film that I just think of straight yes, away when I see yes. a name. And as soon as you said it, it's like, of course. Uh, apologies, Andy, I put you, you on the spot. You have put me on the spot. There. Now, now I'm doing a live Google whilst we carry on with the thing. So you carry on talking and I'll just... Uh, Andy, I just had a thought. So she's in The Constant Gardener. And in that film, the main actor is the new M, Mallory. There you go. It's a small well, world, fine. isn't it? Yeah. So before James Bond, what did Daniel Craig do? He was already an established actor in both film and theatre, and he began his career in theatre performing in various productions across London's West End and also on Broadway. He was also in a number of TV shows as well. He was in Heartbeat, Our Friends in the North, and The Young Indiana Jones Chronicles, to name but a few. His film career really started to take off in the 90s and he was in several movies before his breakthrough role as James Bond and some of his uh, more notable uh, films pre-Bond uh, include Laura Croft Tomb Raider uh, which also starred Angelina Jolie, uh, Road to Perdition which was also directed by Sam Mendes who obviously went on to direct Craig in two Bond films and stars Tom Hanks. Layer Cake is Matthew Fawn's film debut and Fawn has directed at least two films, actually, Andy, featuring actors who are rumoured to be in the running to play James Bond. And that's Aaron Taylor-Johnson, famous from Kick-Ass, and Henry Cavill, who, depending on when you listen to this episode, is going to be in the new Argyle film. Finally, uh, Craig was also in the Steven Spielberg film Munich. And he has also received critical acclaim for his performance in the movie The Mother. So let's talk about James Bond. So Craig was linked to play Bond as early as February 2005, but it wasn't until October when the producers announced that Daniel Craig would be the sixth actor to portray James Bond. So make sure you listen to our bonus episode, The Next James Bond, because we do a little look back then and where we talked about some of the actors that was in the running to play James Bond before Daniel Craig was cast. Yeah, um, Hollywood gave him the nickname James Blonde due to his blonde hair. Um, and I remember that being quite a big thing at the time, that uh, how can you have a, a James Bond with blonde hair? Seemed to make a, a big big deal of it. Um, interesting little fact is that he is the only James Bond actor to play Bond in three different decades, the, the noughties, the tens and the twenties. If I was cast as James Bond that day, I think the media would call me something like James receding grey hair Bond, I think. Because I'm getting lots of grey hair now, which I don't know, viewers, um, listeners won't be able to tell, but I don't know if Andy can tell. My wife and daughter tend to pick out my grey hairs. Figuratively, not literally. I think for me, they'd, they'd call me James Fond of Cakes. So I'm uh, not quite as buff as, as Mr Craig. So let's get back to Daniel Craig, enough about me and Andy. So in an interview with the Sunday Times in late 2020, Daniel Craig stated that since shooting the first film, he knew how he wanted a character to end. He stated that real tragedy is when you have no choice and you have to find a way to make his death no choice. Now, I don't know how you feel about that, Andy, because when we're doing our research for this episode, I, I don't know if that sits well with me, if I'm honest. It's an interesting 
interesting that's that word again um it's a fascinating thought isn't it that he has so much say in the character of bond not that there's anything wrong with that in terms of being invested and you know really wanting to take ownership of the part but i just wonder how much say connery had in in the role or how much say more had in the role obviously there's certain ways you can play it there's certain ways you can you can act you the way you speak the way you move those kind of things but is it really up to him to say how he wants the character's tenure to end that that seems maybe overstepping the mark yeah and that that was my thoughts when researching this episode because like you said you can't imagine connery doing that but you couldn't anyway you couldn't kill him off so early in the franchise could you no you couldn't but with the, with the franchise being as it is why would you ever want to kill it off now like you know let's let's just take a hypothetical let's say in moore's day moore said you know what 10 films for bond is enough so let's let's kill him off in the spy you love me or moonraker or you know around that sort of time you you still think he's is overplaying his hand but maybe there's a bit of like yeah okay i understand we've we've had enough time let's go but once you're established for this long that's a huge decision to make make a call like that yeah especially considering he said that shooting the first film so he is a newbie a part of me thinks andy if this was set in the kind of supernatural genre james bond could be like doctor who you know when he regenerates with new each new actor would he have his own tardis well instead of the tardis it would be like a different type of aston martin yeah enters enters the db5 as daniel craig and comes out as henry cavill or aaron taylor johnson or dot 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 fill in fill in the blanks yourself listeners could be anyone as of this time we don't know but i'm hoping we'll find out soon but anyway let's get a little bit back on track here so another comment he made was that he felt that it was the happiest bond had ever been at the, at the time of, of his ending because he'd found exactly what he was looking for like everyone on earth he was looking for love yeah in no time to die is is very much a whirlwind of feelings isn't it in terms of how he was at the beginning during the film and the in and the ending so yeah i think you have to agree what craig said then so even though you know thinking of it personally andy even though daniel craig isn't my favorite james bond actor and make sure you listen to the the other episodes and you can find out who my favorite james bond actor is you can't deny that daniel craig's portrayal of james bond is widely regarded as one of the most successful as we've talked about before in terms of box office but also the the most impactful in the franchise history as well and you can't really deny that Craig brought a fresh and gritty edge to the character. And I know, Andy, you, you've mentioned things like the Dark Knight trilogy, Bourne before as well. And it's interesting because previously you've seen like Roger, Ma Roger Moore, even um, people like Sean Connery, more suave and sophisticated spy. And he, he manages to capture the different types of characteristics in terms of toughness, toughness um, vulnerability and charm as well you can't deny that daniel craig is a or well, you you won't deny it because he's your favorite bond but he is probably the best actor that's played bond even though he's not my favorite i would uh, tend to agree with that yeah and, and um i would never argue with someone who says he wasn't their favorite because you know it's personal taste and there's been many different portrayals and i would say the vast majority have been very very good even even Dalton as as my least favorite it was, it was a pretty good Bond. Just depends, you know, what you look for out of the films, what your feelings. But for me, it feels like he took he almost took the best parts of each Bond actor, and then made them into the best version of Bond. So you think of the wit of a Sean Connery. You think of the the grittiness and the realism that Timothy Dalton brought to the role. You think of Pierce Brosnan's era and the action scenes that were prevalent throughout his films. Craig kind of brings all those things together but in some ways plays it better I think particularly when I compare him to Dalton I know Craig himself I think has said that he he took a lot of um what's the word I'm looking for influence he took a he was influenced by Dalton's uh, portrayal um, but he also had a way of showing weakness and flaws of character and he kind of brought um a more human side to Bond uh, and I I liked that that whole mix let's um let's change tack slightly and talk about 
the kind of things we talk about on the main rating room pod, and that's some of the rankings. So Jay and I, we ranked and rated each of the Daniel Craig Bond films in season one. Jay, do you want to go through your your ratings and rankings first? Yeah, so Craig's been in five films, and I've put Casino Royale in number one in terms of Daniel Craig with eight out of ten. Skyfall, eight out of ten. No Time to Die, eight out of ten. So for me, very difficult to separate um, these three. Quantum of Solace, six out of ten, and Spectra, six out of ten. So for me, out of a possible 50 points, Craig's films have got 36, which is an average of 7.2 over out of 10, which I think is pretty solid, Andy. How about you? Pretty solid indeed. I've um, I've been a bit kinder with mine. So Skyfall is my, my number one Craig Bond film, and indeed my number one Bond film. 10 out of 10 for me. I then had Casino Royale second place with a 9 out of 10. No Time to Die with a 9 out of 10. Again, both top draw films in similar veins to what you've mentioned and then like you i've got spectre as a seven out of ten and quantum of solace seven out of ten in terms of they're, they're my bottom two although in a flipped order but all of craig's films were really really strong i just felt skyfall stands head and shoulders above everything and casino royale no time to die were were top draw as well so so my generous scoring gives him a total of 42 out of 50 for an average of 8.4 yeah and i think the thing that's quite fascinating is overall we do have some variation between what we've scored but generally speaking the film rankings are quite similar so for example casino royale and skyfall occupy the first and second spots in both of our rankings indeed and uh, quantum of solace inspector I could say the same about those taking up fourth and fifth and no time to die smack bang in the middle of them yeah so i think apart from the scoring's slightly different. I think the films in generally, I would probably say, is there or thereabouts. We we see more variation in the other Bond actor films, don't we? So Craig's are quite consistent. So let's have a quick chat about the five Bond films that Craig features in. Yeah, so first up, we had Craig's debut in Casino Royale. It's a, a gritty, realistic reboot of the franchise. Features Craig in a more brutal version of Bond, but also flawed. It's a uh, it's thrilling, it's captivating film, and it follows Bond on his first mission as a double O agent. The film is well directed by Matt Martin Campbell, who obviously came back from directing GoldenEye, and features strong performances from its cast. So Daniel Craig delivers a superb performance as Bond, showcasing a grittier and more vulnerable side to the character, which we've both obviously mentioned earlier on. The film is well directed by Martin Campbell and features strong performances from its cast. Daniel Craig delivers a superb performance as Bond, showcasing a gritty and more vulnerable side to the character, which we obviously discussed earlier. And it should also be noted that Martin Campbell returns to the franchise after directing Brosnan in his debut, GoldenEye. Eva Campbell also shines as Vesper, Bond's love interest and partner in the mission. Mads Mikkelsen played the role of Shifei, and he portrayed the character with a sense of coldness and calmness, making Le Chiffre a truly menacing presence on screen. Indeed, can't argue that. The action sequence, impeccably choreographed, and the high-stakes poker game was uh, a unique and tense backdrop for the film's climax. I think it's uh, a good mix of action and drama, isn't it? Um, I'd say overall, Casino Royale is a refreshing and modern take on the James Bond franchise. And I would argue it's a must-see for fans of the Bond series and for anyone who's a fan of a, a good spy thriller. Yeah, I definitely agree about that. You don't have to be a, be a Bond fan to enjoy Casino Royale. So we've gone from Craig's debut to the next Bond film, which is the shortest Bond film in the franchise, Quantum of Solace. So Quantum of Solace is a fast-paced, action-packed film that picks up right where Casino Royale left off. Yeah, another solid performance by Craig as James Bond. He's on a mission to avenge the death of Vesper Lind, whilst also unravelling a larger conspiracy involving this shadowy organisation called Quantum. He, Craig really showcases his physicality and intensity in this film and through that the numerous action sequences. Yeah, for me, this one wasn't as highly scored as some of the other Bond films, and I do feel that the film's emphasis was on action over story, 
and it can make the film feel a bit shallow at times. However, Quantum of Solace may not reach the heights of its predecessor. It's still entertaining and a worthy addition to the James Bond franchise. Yeah, so it's a fun film all round. It's visually stunning. You know, it's, it's, it's some fantastic scenery and the way it's shot is, is really, really good. And some very strong performances by Olga Kurilenko as Bond's ally Camille and Matteo Amalric as the villain Dominic Green. So next up, Skyfall, the film that achieved the first 10 out of 10 on the Rating Room podcast. The perfect Bond film, a quote attributed to Andy, which we might see included on the future copies of Skyfall's physical media. I can imagine that. 10 out of 10. The perfect Bond film. Andy, the rating room. You think like maybe when they release the 20th anniversary uh, Blu-ray in 2032? And that might be the, the quote. Could be. We, our podcast could have been really successful, Andy. And we could have millions of listeners. We could have bought the franchise from from Amazon Prime by this point. What did, what did they pay? 800 million? We'll have, yeah, well, yeah, we'll, yeah. We'll have made that money by then, surely. <laughs> yeah, but back, back to Skyfall. Um, it's a masterful addition to the James Bond franchise. A thrilling and emotional resonant story that explores the character of Bond in new and very profound ways. Once again, Craig delivers an outstanding performance, capturing Bond's vulnerability and determination as he faces his toughest adversary yet. There's definitely a theme here with Craig showing vulnerability throughout these films, Andy. So the film features a standout performance by Javier Bardem as the villainous Raul Silva, who provides a formidable challenge for Bond, both physically and mentally. Now, Andy ranked Silva as his favorite villain across the whole Bond franchise. So make sure you go back and listen to the Skyfall episode to, you know, find out what made Bardem so good. Yeah, it's, um, it's a mesmerizing performance by Bardem. Uh, combination of charm, menace, and there is a vulnerability. It makes him a very compelling and unpredictable character. And there's that twisted sense of humor and that flair for the dramatic that he has, which just just added to the whole kind of unsettling nature of his character. Just a just a fantastic performance by Bardem and a really, really, you know, an amazing villain. Uh, just you know, one of the reasons why it scored a, a perfect 10 out of 10. Uh, another reason is the director, Sam Mendes. He expertly balances action and drama, and delivering some of the most visually stunning and inventive sequences of the entire franchise. Overall, Skyfall is a triumphant entry in the Bond series, cementing its place as one of the greatest action films of all time. So let's move on to Spectra. So Craig once again delivers a strong performance as Bond, showcasing his phys physicality and wit in the face of danger. The plot at times is a bit convoluted and overstuffed, with too many subplots that detract from the main story. And if you go back and listen to that, I remember my wife commenting about how many places Bond visits in Spectra and also the, the the train station in the middle of the desert and the Bond girl. Why why do we need those? Why? Yeah, it seemed to uh, create more questions than answers, doesn't it? Um, it features, the film features the return of Ernst Stavro Blofeld and we've got Bond's latest love interest, Dr. Madeline Swan. Uh, so in fact, it still manages to deliver an entertaining and satisfying Bond adventure. There's enough twists and turns to keep audiences on their edge of their seats, but I do agree with your earlier point around too many subplots. Yeah, and we've got the introduction of Dr. Madeline Swan. I always find, I always wonder, Andy, when I say that, do I call her Madeline, but then am I not recognizing that she's a doctor? Do I call her Dr. Swan? But then in the film, everyone calls her Madeline. So I get confused, Andy. I don't know what's the best way. Maybe I call her Dr. S, so, you know, something informal like that. Or Mads. Okay. Maddie. Mads. <laughs> yeah, hopefully she won't go lost, but yeah. So the introduction of Dr. Madeline Swan adds depth and complexity to the film. She is a strong and intelligent Bond girl. So Swan is portrayed with a sense of independence, courage, and vulnerability that makes her more than just a damsel in distress. She also makes it into Andy's top three Bond girls across the whole franchise. So it's this Daniel Craig era, it, you know, has got some really high points for you, Andy, hasn't he? In terms of your Raoul Suva, your favorite villain, Dr. Madeline Swan, top three Bond girls, and obviously the first 10 out of 10 in the, um, season one as well. I think it just really kicks into high gear for me. 
you know, cement my uh, my Bond fandom. Um, and then let's finish off this with uh, No Time to Die. It's a thrilling and emotionally deep film. Serves as a fitting finale for Daniel Craig's tenure as James Bond. The film starts with Bond retired from active duty, but he's forced back into action to confront a new threat. Craig delivers an outstanding performance as Bond. He captures the intensity and vulnerability of the character. And uh, I have a, a question a little bit off topic here regarding this. Do you think Craig should have been nominated for, maybe even won the Oscar for his portrayal? Because I seem to recall there being a little bit of chatter about his exclusion or his, you know, it wasn't included in the the nominations and a lot of people felt that this really should have been his defining moment potentially um a we might have to do a bit of like googling andy to see who was in the running for best actor in 2021 this is a little bit off script i know i've thrown i've thrown a curveball into the proceedings here haven't i so if it's 2021 will smith won it for king richard interestingly javier bardem was nominated so that's a valid point andy so the film also features standout performances for lashana lynch as a new double o agent nomi with Anna de Armas as a skilled cia agent paloma now director carrie joji fukunaga balances action and drama delivering a satisfying conclusion to craig's bond arc that will leave audiences probably both exhilarated and emotional and when you read the james bond subreddits mixed Splits in the middle, very um, like Marmite. The ending of this one, it very much is, and even just kind of in in chatter with people at work or friends. Yeah, so it's a mixed bag, but overall, I'd say No Time to Die is a must see for Bond fans, and it's it is a great send off for one of the the greatest portrayals of of the iconic spy in cinema history, and it, you know, my opinion, is the best Bond that there's been so far before we move on to the next segment andy let's just think so no time to die if it wasn't for the pandemic it what year would have it come out from memory because it got delayed didn't it do you know what the original release date? i think the original release date was april 2020 so just just after the world shut down so then it was delayed a number of times before eventually it was released was it september 21 yeah 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 21 yeah but april so, 2020 originally you know one of the things that, and i'm going off topic but i'm not because it is about james bond and no time to die but it's not really about daniel craig one of the things i struggle with and maybe we should have discussed in no time to die episode andy was if they had filmed it all and it was ready for release in 2020 how come three years later we still don't have the announcement of who's the next James Bond? Even though they delayed the release date, you would imagine the producers could have started and start casting people, surely. I, I'm just a bit confused. You know how they keep saying, that, oh, it's going to be at least another two years at the time of when we're recording this episode. That's the bit I'm just struggling with at the moment. I, I tend to agree. And not only when you compare it to the release date of the film, but they will have known way before that Craig wasn't coming back. I mean, you know, there was talk that he wouldn't come back after Spectre, wasn't he? He it, it was quite vocal in his, uh, his feelings at the time that he never wanted to play Bond again. But he did play Bond that, that one final time. But yeah, they would have known. They would know it's the end. They would have known the ending. They obviously agreed to it because it, it, made, the, it made the big screen. Where's the foresight? Where's the planning? And just... Um, yeah some something is off there isn't it yeah and i know and I, I don't know if you like marvel films andy but people can knock marvel films in terms of how many come out a year but at least one of the things they do really well is plan everything out they're constantly thinking you know in the next few years and how they all can all can be interlinked and like you said before the the spectre ending potentially um could have been a fitting ending for Bond. I know you like No Time to Die, but you, you've said before, haven't you, that could have been a good in, good ending. So there would have been, like you said, they would have known this one was his last film. So in terms of succession planning, I'd, I'd, just, I'd just struggle with it. I just really do in terms of not knowing. You can imagine 
in terms of publicity and marketing they want to keep quiet you know when it's Daniel Craig's last film and you know in terms of releasing things and not worrying about box office being impacted but you would have thought they could have got someone lined up get all the contracts sorted out once everything's settled down you could even announce a new bond when no time to die was coming out and say blu-ray or something you know in terms of boosting the kind of marketing side of things yeah it just there's all kind of things that could have been done in the background and maybe you know maybe there's there's stuff that is going on that we're just not privy to and for and there are reasons beyond control as to why this information is not being released but it does it does on the surface appear to be either lack of planning or just a lack of knowing where it is that they want to go like confusion like or you know lack of ideas but yeah it um it's frustrating because we all want to know who the next james bond is we all want another james bond film so you know let's get moving and i think i figured it out andy i think the producers barbara and um, michael are waiting for season one of the rating room to finish so your calendar is freed up that's what they're waiting for that's it I'm, i've insisted that they don't do any filming on wednesdays <laughs> so i can still maintain my role in this podcast i wonder if you're gonna have the um the contractual um restriction about not being able to wear a tuxedo in other forms of media in other productions i'm okay with that restriction <laughs> to be honest <laughs> As, as you can tell, our listeners won't be able to tell, but uh, I'm not in my tuxedo right now. <laughs> and I, I dare say you've never seen me in a tuxedo. No. no. Mainly because I've only ever wore a tuxedo once in my life. And you weren't there for that. <laughs> That's what you think, Andy. I might have been spying on you. But let, let's move on. Um, let's just park talking about James Bond for a few minutes and talk about Craig's notable other projects that he's been in. So I'm going to kick us off. So he's been in Layer Cake, Road to Perdition, Munich. Yeah, there was also The Golden Compass, Defiance, Cowboys and Aliens. The Girl with a Dragon Tattoo, which is the remake of the Scandinavian version, and Logan Lucky. And there's the, the two Knives Out films on, on Netflix. There is the original Knives Out and then the sequel Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery. And an interesting tidbit there, Nice Out obviously features um, De Armas, who played Paloma from um, No Time to Die, and Glass Onion features Batista, Dave Batista, who played Mr. Hinks in Spectra. So a couple of Bond links there. So let's talk about our favourite film. So I'm going to pick, actually, Andy. So we're going to pick our favourite five films, not including Jay's Bond, that are Daniel Craig films. So these are the ones that we personally like. So Andy, do you want to go first this week? So I've I've waxed lyrical, haven't I, about Craig's portrayal of Bond and how great he is. I've not seen him a lot else. That's this is um, this is a, a a confession I have to make that I can't give you a top five because I've only seen him in two other films. Uh, one of those is Lara Croft Tomb Raider. And I don't remember him in it at all because it's been so long since I've seen it. And the other one is Road to Perdition, the Tom Hanks film, which I do remember him in. But again, it's been been a while since I've seen that. Road to Perdition I enjoyed quite a bit. Lara Croft, Tomb Raider, not so much. What about you, Jay? Have you got, you got five? You Surely you can do better than me for this list. Well, I've got five. And I probably could have put on a few more, if I'm honest, because I've seen a few of his films. But these are my... I say my favourite five films. So Layer Cake is a um, gangster classic. I, I really enjoy Layer Cake. I watched it again recently, a few weeks ago, actually. The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo is is very good. The book's good. And the original Scandinavian version is good. I think it might be. I can't remember if it's Danish or Norwegian. Um, but the original film's very good. But also Daniel Craig's version is very good. He, he he's very He's very versatile, Daniel Craig is, actually. Knives Out and Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery both are very good and I would struggle to pick my favourite out of those two because I really enjoy both of those films. Um, it is a bit... Hmm, I'm trying to think of the word. It is a bit quirky and he he has a um, 
a, a southern state accent in both of those which takes a bit of getting used to my wife watched about 10 minutes of Knives Out and she, she couldn't be doing with it um, but it's very good because even though Daniel Craig I would say is probably the the main actor it does focus on a lot of of the other characters in in both films so it's really good and then Road to Perdition is is on the list as well makes my top five uh, another good film now this next segment is where we compare Rotten Tomatoes and IMDB in terms of what do audiences think and also you know the IMDB ratings of Rotten Tomatoes so I'm going to kick us off and talk about Rotten Tomatoes so these are the top five Craig films on Rotten Tomatoes not including documentaries and uncredited roles because Andy interestingly one of the top five films in I think it's either Rotten Tomatoes IMDB is one of the Star Wars films where he was uncredited as a clone trooper or a storm trooper I'm not a big fan of Star Wars I watch him but I couldn't tell the difference I seem to remember you talking about that in a either a previous episode or or offline I'm I'm not a Star Wars fan either so it means nothing to me but I'm guessing Craig was and is it, it, yes and it, I took that one out because it does skew things a bit because you know we are not including uncredited roles so in terms of Rotten Tomatoes we got Knives Out number one with a Rotten Tomatoes rating of 97 an audience of 92 percent Casino Royale 94 and 90 percent Fateless rating of 94 percent and 83 percent it's a bit of variation there Glass Onion and Knives Out Mystery 92 percent uh, across both Rotten Tomatoes and audience score and Logan Lucky is 92% to Rotten Tomatoes and 76% audience score so a bit of variation so both the Knives Out films are in the top five on Rotten Tomatoes yeah that's good to know and uh, when you look at IMDB which also excludes documentaries and credits of roles there's a little bit of crossover in terms of the list but a different order and a few differences along the way so the number one film according to IMDB for Daniel Craig is Casino Royale which had an 8.0 rating Knives Out comes in at second place with a 7.9 Skyfall is on the IMDB list in third place with a 7.8 The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo in fourth also with a 7.8 and then Road to Perdition comes in at the top five with 7.7 so there's a little bit of variation there I think there's only two films that appear on both lists and interestingly they are the top two on both lists just in different orders yeah and I think what's telling is across both the the um, different websites there's only two James Bond films Casino Royale obviously duplicated in both of them so he's his better roles don't seem to be James Bond films do you think that's a bit little bit of anti-James Bond snobbery yeah there'll be some people that might just dismiss James Bond so therefore his ranking I don't want to say artificially because it's, it's still a valid score isn't it people might have not watched it though maybe people like my wife <laughs> she's not interested so if you ask her she's True. not going to put a Bond film on on any list I wouldn't think she, she might be down down voting it you know what is it what's it called rating bombing she might be doing but it'd be interested to see so what we're going to do in our end of season special is include the Rotten Tomatoes and IMDB rankings as well so we can see the full list of James Bond films there because I, I'd be intrigued to see Andy what are the Rotten Tomatoes and IMDB ratings for them and how different they are to our ratings at the end of the season it is we'll find out who is the real source of truth and uh, you know maybe move movie goers from all over the world will will shun IMDB and Rotten Tomatoes and just come to the rating room for their for their ratings in future indeed indeed so our last segment is the nominations and awards for Daniel Craig so we've got the BAFTAs so that's the British Academy Film Awards and Daniel Craig was nominated once so far at, at time of recording which is early 23 nominated for best actor in the leading role for Casino Royale and Golden Globe Awards he's been nominated twice for best actor 
in a motion picture for music or comedy for Knives Out and Glass Onion, a Knives Out mystery. There's, there's also the Empire Awards, where he's actually been nominated four times for Best Actor in a Leading Role. Casino Royale and Quantum of Solace both make the list, as does Skyfall. And uh, the only non-Bond film that he was nominated for was The Girl with the Dragon Tattoo. And he actually won the award for Casino Royale. So there's a bit more Bond love from the Empire Awards. And also nominated for Best British Actor for Layer Cake. So thank you for tuning in to the Daniel Craig bonus episode from The Rating Room. We hope you enjoyed listening as much as we enjoyed making it for you. We appreciate your feedback and support, which help us improve and deliver better content. Yeah, if you have any questions or suggestions for future episodes, feel free to reach out to us on the usual social media channels. We do love hearing from our listeners. And make sure you listen over the next few weeks to some more episodes that we've got coming up. We're featuring interviews with a range of James Bond superfans from across the world. And we've also got an end of season special in the pipeline that's going to be released in the not too distant future. So thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you soon. Well, that's this week's episode done. We hope you enjoyed it. Special thanks to the band Sugar Tongue for the theme tune to the rating room. You can find them on all the usual social media channels. And be sure to check out their song The System, available now on Spotify. You can find and message us on Twitter, Facebook, TikTok and Instagram by searching The Rating Room. You'll find all our social media links on our website, theratingroom.com and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Or feel free to drop us an email at theratingroom at gmail.com. Goodbye, thanks for listening and we'll see you next week, right here on The Rating Room. <laughs>